Hi students, welcome to uh, Principles of Marketing, uh, Marketing 3336. Uh, this is Professor Ahern and today we're going to be covering uh, Chapter 12. Uh, the title of Chapter 12 is Marketing Channels Delivering Customer Value. So today we're going to be talking about the concept of channels and channels of distribution in particular. We're going to be thinking about it from a marketing perspective and the way the product is distributed and marketed downstream. Uh, from the manufacturer all the way to the end user. So um, this is actually quite an important chapter for us to understand the foundations or fundamentals of, of the concepts within marketing and supply chain management. Um, we actually have an entire major in focus in supply chain in the Bauer College of Business. So if this is something of interest to you, I recommend that you pursue that or look more into taking courses in this particular area. Let's start off by talking a little bit about the idea of uh, supply chains and the value delivery network. So when we think about supply chains, and this is the way products are supplied and the value that can be brought to the marketplace on products, we have what we call upstream partners and downstream partners. Upstream partners are firms that supply raw materials, components, parts, information, finances, and expertise needed to create a product or service. So what that is, is think about everything that goes into that product or service from the raw materials to every component of that product in order to actually produce, manufacture, or supply that product downstream to the marketplace. These are what's called upstream partners that happen within a marketplace. Recognize that the markets and the way we sell products is far more complex than simply a customer going to a retail store. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about today when we talk about these supply chains and value networks. So we have our upstream partners, and then we have our downstream partners. Downstream partners include marketing channel or distribution channels that look towards the customer. So they include retailers and wholesalers. So this is after we have the product or service completely set and we're looking to get that product or service out to customers and have them use that end product or service, we look to downstream partners as a mechanism to get that product out and sell that product and supply it to downstream partners. So upstream partners help in the production and supply of information and products and services to get that product or service ready for the market and downstream partners help in the distribution and marketing of that information downstream to end users and customers in those marketplaces. So it's important for us to know these two terms. Next, we'll talk about two uh, important terms that we'll use quite a bit. The first is what we call supply chain and then demand chain. The supply chain is how we make and sell. Uh, this is, this view, includes the firm's raw materials, productive units, and factory capacity. So this really comes at the concept of how do we supply the materials and the chain of materials that go into the actual production and manufacturing of our products. The demand chain, just like the, when we think about up and down, the demand chain is the sense of uh, and respond element. So this, this view suggests that planning starts with the need to the target customer. So the demand chain thinks about the fact that customers demand products, and as a result of those product and service demand, upstream we, we then supply those products and produce those products to fulfill that demand. That's what we call the demand chain. So we have a supply chain where that information and products are supplied, and demand chain downstream where the demand is produced for those products to be able to fulfill that demand. These are two viewpoints we look at from the supply and value delivery network. So when we think about marketing channels as opposed to fully a, a distribution channel, a marketing channel is a set of in independent organizations that help make a product or service available for use or consumption by the consumer or business uh, user. So what we're talking about is the marketing channel is, is, and we'll give you some really good examples here today and we'll talk about this, is, is a set of organizations downstream that we work with uh, to be able to make our product service available so that the end consumer can access it and buy it and consume it. 
Simple example of this. A manufacturer may, uh, uh, makes um, gum. We produce different kinds of gum. Think about any gum manufacturer. Those gum manufacturers don't simply just take that gum and sell it to end users usually. What they do do is they use what's called an intermediary or a channel to get that gum out to people. So where might you buy gum? You might buy gum at a grocery store, a convenience store. You might buy gum through the internet, through Amazon. But there's all kinds of ways in which we can get gum, and these are called distribution channels. And, and these channels help us to market and supply those products to the end customer. That's what we're talking about when we talk about a marketing channel or a distribution channel in this case. So we can have, there, these distributors actually provide a really helpful resource for us. So let me give you an example of this. And, and let's just think of a grocery store as an example. Let's think of HEB uh, as a mechanism of distribution. So HEB obviously does not make and produce every product that you can buy at HEB. They supply, they get this, these products that they fill their shelves with at HEB when you go grocery shopping from many different suppliers and manufacturers upstream. So all of these people supply to them and they take that, they make it available to you so you can go in and shop and have this big inventory of product that then you choose from so that you can then bring those home in a shopping basket and use those in your grocery shopping. Think about if we didn't have an intermediary like this. So we had milk manufacturers, we had, um, uh, we had beef and meat manufacturers, we had bread manufacturers, we have all the different ones out there that are out there. And let's say they had to communicate and, and work with every single customer for them to be able to get products. And if you as a customer had to work with all these different manufacturers to get your supply of all the products you need in order to make your grocery basket full, that would cause a tremendous amount of complexity and difficulty for you to be able to shop and get all that. But what that distributor does is they actually take in all of that stuff, they package it, put it on the shelves, help to market it, and get it out to that end consumer. And as a result of that, the number of contacts that that distributor takes and consolidates really makes it much better for that customer. Now, this is true for all kinds of distributors. We were talking about retail, but these are all kinds of distributors that take on this function of helping companies get their products and services to market more efficiently so that that market can leverage what we call these intermediaries in the marketplace. So what are some of the value that we talked about that value of helping them distribute, but there's lots of different things that intermediaries can do. They can help to provide additional information about those products and services to the end user. They can help you promote things. They can, you know, put promotions in place for your products and services. Put, so for example, when you go into a grocery store to shop, you would see maybe your product on an end aisle cap. When you're walking there, you see a big promotion for it. Maybe somebody's giving tests out, things like that, promoting your product. Maybe there's things going on to bring attention to our products on the shelf. This is a promotion element. Um, they can make contacts for us to be able to get people in there and get them looking at or shopping for our products. They can match people to our products, help them. People are searching for things. They can fulfill that, that, that need for somebody for their search. Give you an example. There are distributors or intermediaries. We're just not talking about groceries. It could be insurance. There are these independent agents that work with lots of different insurance companies to bring in insurance products. And you as a customer might go in and say, I want life insurance. So what they do is they go out and shop lots of different um, agencies or lots of different um, uh, life insurance companies to find the one that works best for you. Gives you the best price, gives you the best information, gives you the best deal. And as a result of that, they've worked as an intermediary to add value, but they've also added value to all these different insurance companies by helping you shop and match you up with the insurance company that works best for you. They help negotiate deals for you. They work in the physical distribution of products. Think about the retail stores we talked about. They often will help in financing, for example. 
Um, so maybe they have an expensive product on the shelf and you can't afford it. They'll provide a finance plan for you to get it. Um, this is true with automobiles, for example. Um, so, um, so we have, uh, let's say you're, you're going out there and shopping for a, a new Toyota. So Toyota uh, gets their cars out to the retail distribution uh, network. These retail distributors you shop at are independent of Toyota. But what they do is you go in and shop for your Toyota, and then they develop a financing plan for you. They can add their own financing plan to make it possible for you to have that Toyota. They take risk on, they bear risk by having products and services uh, to distribute uh, in their store. So there's a lot of things that they do to add value on top of simply just making an opportunity for somebody to just buy from them. So let me give you some examples. There's lots of different variants of channels of distribution. There's a number of levels of what we call channels of distribution. So we see the most simple one is where we have, and we're going to talk about B2B versus B2C. Over, over on this side of the picture here, this is what we call the consumer markets. So if we think about uh, consumer markets, these are where uh, an end consumer is shopping and utilizing our product, okay? So that's a consumer market. So you see here consumer marketing channels. Here are business marketing channels. This is where a business end user ends up consuming our product or using it. So I'll give you an example for both of these. What we see is there are intermediaries that take place between the producer and the consumer in both of these situations. So we have situations where the producer produces the product and they sell it directly to the consumer. So that often would happen through internet sales or actually people just going in and making shopping right at that producer's uh, uh, site. So an example of this is uh, Geico, uh, for example. Geico go goes direct. So if you want to shop for insurance through Geico, you go directly to Geico and they go to the consumer, okay? So, um, so that's, a, that's an example. Sorry about that flipping back and forth. The next we have as an example is, uh, is when we have a retailer or intermediary between that. So the producer produces the product. The producer produces the product and they sell it through a retailer and then it goes to a consumer. This is what we've talked about as a, as a classic example of a retailer. This could be at HEB, this could be uh, any of those different Best Buy or any of those. So the producer produces their product, they give it to the retailer, it goes to the end consumer. We also have many situations where a producer goes to a wholesaler and the wholesaler goes to the retailer and then the retailer goes to the end consumer. So we have different layers of, of uh, channel distributors. The, the more complex distribution channels have multiple layers within them. This whole kind of thing happens also within the business markets as well, with companies or business customers down here making the same types of consumption decisions as the consumer and using these intermediaries to help them distribute their products and services downstream. Now what happens, I wanna talk about this. There's a, a classic uh, thing that happens when you have multiple layers within your system. So you have a producer that's producing a product, they sell it to a wholesaler, the wholesaler sells their products to a retailer, and then the retailer sells it to a consumer. The more intermediaries you have, the less communication you have between this producer and this end consumer. As a result of that, you have a communication that takes place here, one that's here, and one that's here. That causes something called the bullwhip, bullwhip effect. And that's when information does not make its way efficiently downstream from the producer to the consumer. We're gonna watch a little video to learn more about what we call the bullwhip effect here. Day is bullwhip effect. The bullwhip effect refers to a frustrating phenomenon that frequently starts with falling customer demand, although it could start with the reverse, a previously unanticipated rapid rise in customer demand. This falling customer demand prompts retailers to under order so as to reduce their inventories. The bullwhip effect can be explained as an occurrence detected by the supply chain, where orders sent to the manufacturer and supplier create larger variance than the sales to the end customer. These 
regular orders in the lower part of the supply chain develop to be more distinct higher up in the supply chain. This variance can interrupt the smoothness of the supply chain process as each link in the supply chain will over or underestimate the product demand, resulting in exaggerated fluctuations. Through the numerous stages of a supply chain, key factors such as time and supply of order decisions, demand for the supply, lack of communication and disorganization can result in one of the most common problems in supply chain management. This common problem is known as the bullwhip effect, also sometimes the whiplash effect. In this blog post, we will explain this concept and outline some of the contributing factors to this issue. Okay, so that's a little bit of information about what we call one of the most common phenomena of when these intermediaries don't speak to each other or give each other detail downstream. They just place orders and it, and it causes a lack of communication. It causes this element or thing called the bullwhip effect. So for example, you may have downstream somebody making a bigger order than usual. Um, and then what we see is that order gets exaggerated as it goes upstream because people see a variant or a shock in the system. This is what's called the bullwhip effect. So next let's talk about something that happens out there when we have channel members uh, in the marketplace. So when we have more than one channel member in the marketplace, what we have, and then we have channel players or partners working out there in the marketplace, we have different channel kinds of conflict that it could occur. So channel conflict refers to a disagreement among channel members over goals, roles, and rewards. So I'm gonna give you an example of what we call a horizontal conflict and a vertical conflict. So a horizontal conflict occurs among firms at the same level of a channel. So if two firms are working as intermediaries at the same level, for instance, a firms may complain about others stealing sales for them or, or, or hurting them at that same level of the channel. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, when there's not enough exclusivity of, uh, of distribution uh, within a marketplace, and we're gonna talk about that exclusivity. So um, in, in, this, in the city of Houston, we have three big um, uh, Audi dealerships. So if you wanna buy a car from Audi, you can go to any one of the three dealerships in the city of Houston. Oftentimes what people will do is they will, they will work these dealerships against each other to try to get the best price for an Audi. So you might call Audi Central, Audi North Houston, and Audi South Houston and try to get the best price on a new Audi Q5 uh, sedan, uh, uh, SUV. So you might call up and say, you know, I'm really looking for this Q, Q5 SUV. What's the best you can do? Then you call the other one, you call the other one, you have them competing against each other. That causes what we call a horizontal conflict. Those members are competing against each other that are causing conflict within that. And as a result, you get price erosion and it hurts the overall image because they're making each other look bad by undercutting each other. Another example is what we call vertical. Now that's horizontal because that means a cross. Vertical conflict happens up and down where in the channel or the supply chain, there's conflict that happens. So conflict between different levels of the same channel is even more common. So for example, McDonald's recently faced a growing conflict with its among 3,000 what we call independent franchises. So we'll talk about franchises in a minute, but what an independent franchise is, is that they have paid for the right to distribute McDonald's and they are not officially part of McDonald's, but they're a franchise that owns the right to distribute McDonald's products. So those McDonald's that are out there that are independent, they're not store, company owned, but they're independent franchises. In a recent company webcast, they actually went out to these, the McDonald's went out and they started complaining that they were getting information that the, ca the cashiers at these independent franchises were not pleasant enough. In fact, they recommended that these individuals do more smiling because they're not engaging customers and they're getting a lot of information that McDonald's uh, uh, service workers are not happy or friendly service workers. As a result of that, the service workers and stuff got pretty upset back at McDonald's and McDonald's and the service workers were not happy with McDonald's at the same time because the amount of demand for product at McDonald's during this period had reduced too. 
So there weren't as many people coming into the McDonald's stores. And as a result, there was some tension because there wasn't enough patrons. And as a result of that, they, some of the people's hours were being cut. They were being, their salaries were being cut. So as a result, they, it caused what we call a vertical conflict tension. So that's between the independent uh, distributor of a McDonald's and the parent company McDonald's had a conflict with one another. And that's what we call a vertical conflict. So we have horizontal across, vertical up and down. So we, like we talked about with McDonald's, there are different variants of what we call franchise organizations. What a franchise organization is a contractual vertical marketing system in which a channel member called a franchisor links between several stages of the production and distribution process. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, let's look at, uh, at any of the big donut uh, manufacturers that are out there. So for those of you who've ever been to Canada or the Northeast, you'd see Tim Horton donuts. Uh, you would also see Dunkin' Donuts. But there's all kinds, there's Shipley, there's all kinds of other donut companies that are out there. Now these donut uh, companies are typically set up as what we call franchisees or franchisers. So what they've done is they paid for the right to be able to distribute and use the name of that brand, Dunkin' Donuts. So somebody owns the right for Dunkin' Donuts and to exclusively distribute Dunkin' Donuts in a particular area. And as a result of that, they get training, information, uh, marketing, everything of the benefit of Dunkin' Donuts so that they can distribute, use Dunkin' Donuts products and sell Dunkin' Donuts. But they manage their own, what we call franchise. So franchise is, is an important concept for us to understand. I'd like us to all understand what a franchise is. There are lots of franchise opportunities out there, ranging from beauty products to coffee to food uh, to all kinds of things where people set up their own franchise. And what that is is that an organization sets up a specific system for you to be able to own the rights to, to distribute and they provide you criteria, marketing, and other information to be able to make you more effective. Now let me talk about the difference but really quickly about between horizontal marketing systems and vertical. A horizontal marketing system is a channel arrangement in which two or more companies at one level join together to follow a new marketing opportunity. So sometimes those companies that are across that we talked about can partner with one another. So an this is an example right here where Nestle and Cheerios uh, uh, partnered with one another in this situation to be able to make a specific type of, of Cheerio. Uh, Nestle, Nestle whole grain. You'll see partnerships by two or more vertical players to be able to come together to make things happen. So um, one of the things you'll see is Alexa. You know, you're seeing now this whole thing with Buick and Alexa. So Buick and Alexa are working together um, to be able to make uh, things even better, to make an even better sale of the Buick product with the Alexa product. You start to see more advertising with that. So, another, so that, that's, that's a combination we'd see. The other thing we'll often, to often see the most common thing we see is what we call multi-channel distribution systems. So oftentimes producers will use more than one channel to get their products out there to customers. So think of a producer that's producing, um, in, in, in this case, uh, 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 technology. So an example of this, a technology company like Apple may sell directly to customers. So Apple has Apple stores and Apple stuff and they actually go out and they sell their stuff through catalogs, phones, online, mobile. They sell directly to customers. That's here what we call segment one. They also may sell their products through retailers. Like for example, you can get Apple products through Best Buy at a retailer. So they'll go, they'll sell to Best Buy and Best Buy will sell to you. Another example is they'll actually get it through distributors too. So they'll sell it through a distribution company that'll go out to what we call dealers and those dealers will sell it to the, what we call the business segment. So this is the business side and this is the consumer side. So on the business side, the, the Apple may make Apple technology products that are sold to big businesses and different businesses and they're sold through distributors and dealers or they could actually sell their products directly to businesses 
They can sell servers, larger computer products. They may actually sell it right to a business segment, directly to another company. So in this case, Apple may sell their products to 3M Corporation so that 3M can supply their computers right at 3M. And they may actually use a sales force to do this. So it's not unusual for the companies to sell direct as well as through intermediaries in both the consumer market as well as in a business marketplace. The last thing I wanna to mention today is a little bit about what we call intensity of distribution. And I'd like you to become familiar with this. There are three levels of what we call distribution intensity, and this gets at the exclusivity as well as the intensity of the way in which products are distributed to the market. The first concept is what we call intensive distribution. This is where we try to use as many channels as possible to saturate our products out in the market, get them out as much as we possibly can, and we don't worry about how they get out there, we just distribute them as much as possible. Things like gum, we talked about that before. I don't care who sells my gum, I just want the gum to get out there, be distributed, anybody can sell it, um, and I intensively distribute the product. Think about things that we're not worried about being exclusive or having exclusive rights. We just want as many people to get access to it as possible. That's called intensive distribution. The next is what we call exclusive distribution. This is where we choose only certain people are allowed to distribute our products. So an example of exclusive distribution is what we talked about car dealerships. They might say that you have the exclusive rights to distribute that product in North Houston. You have the exclusive distribution to sell, sell the product in Central, in South Houston. You may actually only, uh, they may actually only allow one distributor in the entire city. So exclusive distribution makes it exclusive to a particular area or marketplace so that we limit the number of suppliers in that to be able to limit the, the opportunity to compete against each other in that market. And then, uh, and that, that exclusive, that makes them exclusive to that area. And then selective distribution is where we choose only a subset of, 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 of agreed upon distributors to be able to sell our product. So I'll give you an example of this. Often, um, often de designer products or often high-end luxury products only want certain types of stores to sell their products. They would not want, for example, you would not want uh, your coach bag sold through some sort of low end store. So what, what it does is coach goes out there and makes deals with certain types of stores for the right to be able to distribute their product to those stores. And they selectively decide what kind of stores are allowed to sell a coach product. They approve it, they go in there and check it out and that's what we call selective distribution. So there are a number of different types of major uh, intermediaries in the marketplace. So this pretty much covers the concept of channels. Um, I know we covered it at a fairly high level. We're gonna get back to a little bit of that more as we move forward in the course. Um, I hope you found this to be interesting. If you did actually find it to be very interesting, uh, the supply chain is a huge thing in the city of Houston. In fact, there are a lot of jobs in supply chain management. So I would look to the supply chain programs at the University of Houston if you are particularly interested. Uh, thanks and, and, and have a great day, everybody.